You know, I think sometimes it's all in the timing. And that's particularly true of a day like today, New Year's Eve, when a rolling set of New Year celebrations kick off going around the globe, time zone after time zone. The first celebrations, did you realize, for New Year's kicked off maybe when you were having coffee still at the house an hour before our worship service began when the people in the Pacific Island nation of Kiribati, which is 14 hours ahead of the U.S. East Coast, began to celebrate the new year. And then when Vicky began playing her prelude at 11 a.m., the fireworks began in Singapore. And when she launches into her postlude at the close of the service, the people of Tokyo and Kathmandu will spill out into the streets to ring in the new year. Now, as Ron mentioned, I'm coming to you here from the Netherlands, which is six hours ahead of Bethesda. So at the stroke of midnight here tonight, there will be an explosion of fireworks. It's all in the fullness of time. Our Gospel reading is also tied to time. As we've been following the Christmas story through the Gospel of Luke, we know that first Mary and Joseph had to travel to take part in the planned Roman census. And now in today's passage, following the birth of Jesus, it's time to bring their son to Jerusalem for the presentation at the temple as was the custom of the law. The law. You may have noticed those repeated references coming up in our scripture. It's a way that Luke underscores how Jesus is a part of this Jewish tradition, embracing it, it being, being nurtured and raised within it. And it's worth noting, pausing, over one little detail that crops up in verse 24, where it notes that Mary and Joseph offered a sacrifice, according to the law, of either turtle doves, quote, turtle doves, or two young pigeons, unquote. The requirements of the sacrifice at the time of an infant's presentation are spelled out in the book of Leviticus. And the offering of turtle dove, of a turtle dove or two young pigeons was an accommodation for the poor. For those who couldn't afford a more impressive animal sacrifice of perhaps an ox or even a goat. The Son of God, the infant lowly, as we sing in another hymn, was born in a stable and into a family of very modest means. It's just a further demonstration of the Christmas miracle of how the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But the fact that Jesus is born into a household that can only afford a sacrifice of a dove or a couple pigeons highlights how urgently God seeks to be in communion with all of us and brings a special care, perhaps, for those who live on the margins of life. There was a man named Simeon, a faithful man. And scripture tells us how the Holy Spirit made it known to him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, you know, I, I personally wonder how long has Simeon been holding that revelation? How long had it been that the Spirit told him about the coming Messiah? Was it just the day before? A month before? A year before? A decade before? Or even longer? How long had he been waiting? But guided by the Spirit, 
Simeon comes into the temple and there he encounters Mary Joseph and the infant Jesus. And he takes the Christ child in his arms and he exclaims, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon's blessing was followed by Anna's blessing. She's a prophet who has been living in the temple for decades. And it shows just a further demonstration of how intent Luke is in showing how integral women are in the faith story. She speaks of how the Christ child will be a source of redemption for Israel and for Jerusalem. Salvation and redemption. Were those possibly on your Christmas list when you were drawing that up? Is that what you were expecting over this past holiday? Did you anticipate that at the celebration of the birth of Christ, that you would receive a revelation, a manifestation of the saving presence and love of God. In the hubbub of what has become Christmas in our society, is that what you experienced? If you experienced that wonder, that awesome gift, I'm very glad. If it somehow passed you by though, in the shuffle of shopping, sending out Christmas cards, preparing the meals, going on travel, the gift exchanges, social gatherings at home or at work, the cleanup of meals, the changing of linens for the guests. If in the midst of all of that, you that might have passed you by, I'm here to remind you that this gift of Christmas remains. The life-giving wonder of the incarnation of God being with us remains. And this Christmas reality awaits you to breathe it in, to embrace it, to seize it with both hands as you go forward in this adventure of living the life that God has gifted to us. And they called him Emmanuel, God with us. But Simeon's message offers more than just praise for this incarnation. After blessing the family, Simeon says to Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Falling and rising. It's a bit of an odd phrasing, isn't it? Don't we usually describe something as rising and then falling? But the inverted sequence follows the words that Mary used herself in her Magnificat when she spoke of the mighty being laid low and the lowly being raised up. And it may also be a foreshadowing of the future of this boy who will fall before he is raised. This mention of opposition of the sword, which will pierce Mary's own soul, is a recognition of what ails the world. That while the Messiah has come, there will be struggles. Theologians describe this phenomena, the incarnation of Christ culminating in Easter Sunday, which is God's decisive inbreaking into the world as the, quote, already and not yet, unquote. The already and not yet. God's salvation has come decisively into the world already through the Christ. But the kingdom of God, as we all know, 
in the midst of all that ails the world has not yet been fully realized. And so as people of faith on this New Year's Eve, we live in this period between the already of Christ's coming and the not yet of the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Now, the early church on this day, on New Year's Eve, adopted a practice of fasting and praying. It was the Moravian church in 1733 which began a practice of a quote-unquote watch night service, an evening of service, an evening service of prayer, um, readings, meditations, on New Year's Eve night. John Wesley brought this tradition into the Methodist practice, which spread into the African Methodist Episcopal Church tradition as well. But it was on December 31st, New Year's Eve of 1862, in the throes of the Civil War, that this watch night service would take on new added significance, especially for the African American church. President Lincoln had announced a hundred days earlier, on September 22nd, 1862, that on January 1st, 1863, he would issue an Emancipation Proclamation in which he would declare that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states, quote, are and henceforward shall be free. And so on December 31st, 1862, Freedom's Eve, as people called it, and on New Year's Eve nights to follow through the years, through till tonight, African Americans gather for worship and prayer at watch night services. Minutes before the midnight hour, people would call out, Watchman, watchman, please tell me the hour of the night. And the minister would reply, It is five minutes to midnight. Then again, Watchman, watchman, please tell me the hour of the night. And the minister would say, it is three minutes before the new year. And then it is one minute before the new year. And then it is now midnight. Freedom has come. Frederick Douglass wrote on that December 31st of 1862, quote, it is a day for poetry and song, a new song. These cloudless skies, this balmy air, this brilliant sunshine are in harmony with the glorious morning of liberty about to dawn on us. It's as though Douglas was holding up the infant freedom in the temple and saying, now you can dismiss your servant with peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. And like Simeon, Douglas could also tell any Black mother, this infant of freedom is destined for the falling and rising of many in America, and to be a sign that will be opposed. A sword will pierce your own soul too. How many African-American mothers and grandmothers, sisters and aunts have had their souls pierced over the years. In these days, how many Palestinian mothers and Jewish mothers and Ukrainian mothers and Russian mothers and Cameroonian mothers and Mexican mothers and all of their fathers and uncles and brothers and nephews had their souls pierced too. On this New Year's Eve, 
we celebrate this gift of salvation through the Christ child that has been given to all of us. This ongoing gift of the presence of God in our lives is decisive. It sustains us through whatever challenges we may face today or in this year that's to come. As we sit on the hinge between 2023 and 2024 on this watch morning service, never forget the already of what God has done. The gift of salvation that's given to each of us through the coming of the Christ child of the word made flesh who has dwelt among us and now through the gift of the Holy Spirit abides within and among all of us this very day. That as we look ahead to both the promise and the challenge of the new year, we can live confidently looking ahead to the not yet, to the kingdom which is yet to come and rededicate our own lives to being instruments of God's hope, love, joy, and peace in this new year. Tonight, many African Americans gathering for a watch night service may sing a song titled, Look Where God Has Brought Us. It's almost an encapsulation of this recognition of the already gift of God's presence with the not yet of what is yet to be fulfilled. Look where God has brought us. Look how far we've come. We're not what we ought to be. We're not what we used to be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Amen.